October 26th. So you'll hear a lot about that before it happens, but it is coming. He's going to talk to us about uh, uh, freedom of the press and national security. He has some experience in that area. And then in November, we have uh, Nash, uh, Ramesh Panuru of National Review, my colleague at National Review, will be, will be coming to campus. So you'll see posters and, and notices about, about that. Um, and before, we, uh, before, before I introduce our introducer, we have a student introducer for our speaker tonight. I just want to say what an honor it is to have Linda Chavez here with us. Uh, we have a, we, at the journalism program, we bring in a lot of speakers, um, three, four semesters sometimes, and uh, share them with you guys. And often they're colleagues of mine, sometimes they're friends of mine. And this is my very favorite one. Uh, Linda, was, uh, Linda was my boss for five years. Uh, she was my mentor. She's still my mentor in a lot of ways. She is my friend. And it's a tremendous honor to, uh, to have her here and share her with you. I've written five books. The first one I wrote when I was working with her, but I've written five books, and four of them are dedicated to people in my family. The fifth is dedicated to her. And when I took this job at Hillsdale College, when I moved out here four years ago, I thought to myself, I want to do for the young people of Hillsdale College the sorts of things she did for me when I was about your age. So um, it's just a tremendous pleasure to, to share her with you and, and an honor to, uh, uh, to bring her here. Uh, and with that, I'm going to introduce our formal introducer. <laughs> she is a senior from Morton, Illinois. She's editor-in-chief of the Collegian. Give it up for Michaela Bennett. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. I want to begin my introduction by saying I didn't actually write an introduction. And that was because I followed the advice of Ms. Chavez, to do, who said that she's given a lot of speeches, some commencement speeches, and said that she never writes out the entire speech. She just has a few bullet points and goes from there. So I'm going to try that out tonight, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> because I had a long day of being exposed to Ms. Chavez. I began my day by having breakfast with her, had her in class, went to lunch with her, um, got to chat with her a little bit beforehand. And I'm just going to list you a couple of, of things about her, of interesting nuggets. And by no way is this all encompassing. So look her up after this. She's an incredibly influential woman um, and has influenced me just in our short discussions today. So hopefully I will expose you to a little bit of that in this introduction. Um, I want to begin that by saying she is a mother of three and a wife and very dedicated. Um, and I realized that through our conversations and so throughout all of these things that she's done, um, she has uh, been a very dedicated um, mother and, and wife to her family and I think that's really important to note. Um, for all of this room of academics, she originally intended to become a professor um, and then decided not to when she realized some of the harsh realities of affirmative action and I'm sure she might mention some of that tonight. She now writes a syndicated column that appears nationwide. She's appeared on many talk shows and radio shows, and tomorrow she's going to appear on Bill Maher. So I think that'll be an interesting experience for her and for us to watch. Um, she was the highest ranking woman, woman in the Ronald Reagan White House as the Director of Public Liaison. And which was something that was really neat for me to hear about, and I hope that she mentions that this evening as well. Um, amidst all this, she found time to be a politician. She ran and lost a seat um, in the uh, Michigan, or for senator for Maryland. Um, she was also the first person to, to see the Watergate burglar. So, um, she <laughs> told us about that today, which I thought was very interesting. And she's now working on a short series of fiction about North Korea. Um, but that's not fiction in that she is just talking about how she feels about it. She's done an incredible amount of real life reporting on it as well. So with that, I would like to now introduce our lovely speaker, Ms. Linda Chavez. Thank you. I've given a lot of speeches over the years. I don't think I've ever had two such nice introductions. <laughs> and by the way, John, you did forget your most important connection to me. 
John is godfather to one of my nine grandchildren. So, um, so he does, he's, he's like my fourth son. Uh, I, I consider him part of the family and his wife Amy and, and their three wonderful children. It's great to be here at Hillsdale. I've been here before, but it's been about 20 years. And the college has changed a lot. And the one thing that has not changed are the students. Now, you're not the same people that were here 20 years ago, Possibly some of you may be the children of the students that I encountered at that point. Um, but it is the same kind of student and the liberal arts education that is provided here at Hillsdale is something that is very rare today. Uh, it's very rare today in American uh, academia. And so I uh, am privileged to be here and privileged to be asked to come back and talk to you. And I'm very eager to talk about a subject that we hear an awfully lot about these days. But unfortunately, it, the subject generates far more heat than it does light. And that is the subject of immigration. And I will tell you that I have been writing about immigration for at least 30 years, and actually longer than that, probably more like 35 years. Um, I've been following this field. I've done a lot of research, including original research, uh, on the subject of assimilation of Hispanic immigrants. Uh, my first book, Out of the Barrio, was about this topic. So it's something that I care a lot about, and I've had a very consistent position on this issue. I had this position when I served in the Reagan administration. I had this position when I ran as a very conservative candidate in the state of Maryland for the United States Senate. And I have the same position today. Um, unfortunately, from my point of view, uh, many people now say, well, she's no longer a conservative. She's certainly not a Republican. She's one of those rhinos because she wants to welcome more immigrants into the United States, and that's the last thing we need. Well, I'm here to give you a conservative's argument for a change in our immigration policy. And I'm going to talk about it in terms of the current political scene. You know, in 2002, uh, the Gallup organization uh, does polling of uh, various issues to decide what issues are topical uh, in political years. And that was an off-year election, but nonetheless an election year. And they polled, you know, uh, voters and to see what topics came to the top in terms of issues that people were concerned about. And in 2002, about 2% 2 of Americans named immigration as a major issue of concern to them. Today, the, uh, I think it was CNN that just did a poll today, and it turns out that 52% of Republican voters believe that illegal immigration is the single most important issue facing us today. Now, you have to ask sort of why is this? The reason that's interesting is that we have had a problem of illegal immigration. Actually, it goes back to when we passed our first laws prohibiting immigration, which was not until 1924. Um, we've had basically numbers of people who came across the border, particularly from Mexico, uh, into the country illegally. Going back in the 1950s, uh, there were more than a million people who came a year illegally into the United States, and that was at a time when our population was about half what it is today. So that would be equivalent to two million today. And we have had uh, an influx of illegal immigrants coming into the United States. But the peak of that influx was between 1995 and 2000. So if it was this horde of you know, new illegal immigrants who were coming in that was causing the concern, you would have expected that in 2002, that would have been when you saw 52% of people concerned about it. Instead, we're seeing that concern today at a time when illegal immigration into the United States is at about a 40-year low. We have not seen as few people crossing in illegally uh, over the last four or five years uh, since the early 1970s. So there's a disconnect there. And I guess, you know, that's part of what I want to talk about it. Now, I think that the reason we're seeing so much concern now is we have a candidate who decided to base his whole candidacy around the issue of illegal immigration, and that is Donald Trump. You know, he came out with his announcement speech in which he said that, you know, we were being invaded essentially by rapists and, and drug uh, sellers, uh, and there might have been a few good people in there. He, 
conceded. Uh, but you had a sense that what he was talking about was a horde of people coming in illegally to the United States, sponsoring crime in the United States, committing crimes here. And that has raised the issue. It has become a very polarizing issue. And so that's one of the reasons that we're hearing a lot about that. Well, I'm here to tell you that most of what um, Donald Trump says on the issue is simply wrong, factually wrong. Uh, whether it's talking about crime or whether it's talking about the numbers, um, he's simply wrong across the board. And, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about immigration and the history of immigration to the United States because, you know, we like to think of ourselves, I've seen the wonderful posters that I understand one of the students uh, designed for this speech, and it's a picture of the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, we like to think of that, you know, Emma Lazarus speech, you know, give us your tired, your hungry, the, you know, the, uh, what is it, the refuse of our teeming shores, uh, of your teeming shores. Uh, it, it, is a, um, it is a way in which we think um, about America as a country of immigrants. And it's true. Most of us, almost all of us, came from someplace else. Even the Native Americans crossed the Siberian uh, Straits and came from someplace else. This was an empty continent uh, at one point. And so we are an immigrant nation, and that's been very important. In the 19th century, uh, the immigrant flows were from Scandinavia, from Germany, and from Ireland. So it was primarily Northern Europeans who came. In the early 20th century, uh, when we had the largest flow of immigrants coming into the United States at any given period, it was from Southern and Eastern Europe. Europe. We had people coming from Italy, from Russia, from Poland, uh, from Greece, Spain. Um, it was primarily throughout Southern and Eastern Europe that the immigrants came. Now, in 1924, uh, we, in fact, uh, made a major change in our immigration policy. America from colonial times till 1924 had largely been a country with open borders. We welcomed everybody. We needed to fill the country with entrepreneurial people who were going to do jobs and build this great nation. And so we welcomed virtually anybody who could get here. Uh, and that included, by the way, uh, people that came in from Mexico as well. But it primarily uh, was uh, Europeans who immigrated. In the late 19th century, we started to import labor, uh, primarily from China. And that really sparked the first immigrant backlash. There were previous immigrant backlashes. There were you know, sort of small backlashes, locally um, uh, important backlashes. But the first real legislative backlash came against Chinese laborers. Uh, who uh, we be began to restrict in the late 1880s. Uh, and then by 1917 and then 1924, we began to restrict legal immigration uh, from Europe. And we set up a quota system <laughs> and basically closed our doors. But before that, if you came to the United States, uh, you came here basically like the Mexicans and Salvadorans and Guatemalans and others are coming illegally today. You just showed up. You showed up. You got a job. Um, if you've been here, it can show that you've been here a certain number of years. Uh, you got to apply to become a naturalized citizen. If you gave birth to children here, they were citizens by birth. Uh, and that has been the history uh, of the country. But despite the fact that we have been this great immigrant nation, we've had a love-hate relationship with immigrants throughout that period. We love the immigrants of our grandparents' generation. And it doesn't matter where they came from. You know, at the beginning of the 20th century, we thought the great immigrants were those Germans and the Irish who were coming. We didn't think very much of the Italians and Jews who were coming in the early 20th century. By, you know, uh, 2015, you have Rick Santorum out saying, you know, well, my grandfather came here as a, an immigrant, but he came the right way. Well, it turns out his grandfather came as a seven-year-old child back during the time of open borders. Um, and so, you know, he came, you know, just like, again, like the Mexicans are, are coming today, just showed up uh, and became an American. So we have had this relationship. Um, and if you read in, uh, if you read the history of immigration, if you read what 
people were saying about Germans in the 19th century, you would think they were talking about Mexican illegal immigrants today. They would never learn English. Their kids demanded to be taught in German. The public was having to educate these kids in German schools. In fact, I was talking to Professor Berzer earlier, and he talked about his family and how they spoke German at home, even after they, you know, even generations had been born here. Uh, they were in enclaves that were German speaking. And in fact, some of the laws that were passed uh, in the early 20th century, including prohibition, were aimed at the German community. They didn't like the fact that Germans came here to open beer halls. And suddenly there was public drunkenness everywhere. And so the temperance movement was also an anti-immigrant movement. So we've had this history. And we're seeing it again now. And so, you know, what I like to think about is why is it that despite the history of being not always fond of the people who are coming now, but looking very fondly back at the people who came before, why is it we do that? Well, it's because we are successful at assimilating people. And so by the time the grandchildren of immigrants are thinking back on immigration, they're already fully assimilated Americans. And so they think, gee, the Germans did it right, or the Italians did it right. It's just these newcomers who aren't doing it right. It is because of the strength of assimilation that we look fondly on the immigrants of the past. And so I want to talk a little bit first about the whole subject of illegal immigration, uh, focus a little bit about who, who it is that is here, how they're coming, what the, what the uh, statistics show about this population. And then I'll get in later uh, to how I see solving the problem of illegal immigration. Uh, in terms, I, I said earlier, in terms of the flow of illegal immigrants into the United States, it has virtually slowed to what it was 40 years ago. Uh, that large peak uh, that occurred between 1995 and 2000, that occurred at a time when you had economic expansion, there were lots of jobs, and so immigrants were coming to do some of those jobs. Uh, they were taking some of the low-skilled jobs, which in turn made opportunities available from some of the people who had those jobs before to move into managerial positions. Now, not everybody. Uh, that didn't happen to everybody. Some people lost out uh, in that game. But the, the big influx was back in the late 1990s. Uh, we reached a peak of about 12 and a half million illegal immigrants uh, a few years ago, right before uh, the recession in like 2007. That was, one, that was the peak of, of uh, the group of, uh, of illegal immigrants who were present in the United States. Since that period, we've seen a decline of about a million people. Uh, a million illegal immigrants have gone home, and they went home for a good reason. The jobs disappeared. Uh, and uh, because we have poured a lot of resources into uh, making the border more secure, it is now much more difficult to get back into the United States, which is one of the reasons uh, that we've you know, seen that decline. In terms of immigration overall, we focus on it in terms of Latino immigrants, Hispanic immigrants, mostly from Mexico, but also from Central America. And that was an appropriate focus for a long time because Mexico was the largest source of illegal immigration and they were also the largest source of legal immigration to the United States. That has been true for 50 years or more. It's not true today. Uh, in fact, for each of the last two years, Mexico has been number three in countries sending immigrants legally to the United States. It's fallen behind China and India now, so that it's number three. And in fact, there is such a decline in the number of Mexicans who are coming that there has been an overall decline, and the Mexican-born population in the United States is now smaller than it was even five years ago. Uh, there's been a large decline in that population. More have either died or left uh, that are being replaced. And some of that is because Mexico's economy uh, during the recession was doing you know, relatively well. There were more jobs. Mexico's birth rate has declined dramatically over the last 50 years. It used to be the average Mexican woman had seven children. Now she has barely more than two on average. Um, uh, so it is a huge change uh, in Mexico, and there are more opportunities uh, more, uh, in Mexico now, even with some of the tremendous problems that are there. So we've seen that decline. 
Nonetheless, we have about 11.3 million people who are here uh, in the United States now uh, illegally. Well, what do we do about this? Um, you know, conservatives say the law is the law. These people broke the law, and therefore they have to pay the consequences. Uh, Trump would say they're criminals. Uh, they've, you know, they've committed criminal offenses by crossing our borders. Well, that turns out actually not to be true. If you cross the border illegally, if you come without documentation, without permission, uh, it is a civil offense. It's more than a parking ticket, uh, but it's not, you know, manslaughter or grand, you know, theft larceny. Uh, it is uh, a, a civil offense uh, that generally, the way our system works for those kinds of offenses, you usually have to pay a fine of some sort in order to clear your name. Well, um, there are criminal offenses if you get caught and get sent home uh, to wherever you came from and then cross again, that then becomes a criminal offense. And if you're a visa overstayer, that can become a criminal offense. But by and large, the bulk of people who are here illegally have not committed a crime as defined in our criminal justice system. They have committed a civil offense. So what should we do about it? Well, Donald Trump and an from my point of view, unfortunately, several uh, Republican candidates and now nearly a majority, about 47 percent of Republican primary voters, think what we should do is round up these people who are illegally here and send them home. Well, let's think about that for a minute. We're talking about 11.3 million people. And, by the way, Trump says he doesn't want to break up families, so let's send all of their American citizen children with him. And those citizens num number 4 million people. So we're talking about 15 million people. What does that mean, 15 million people? It's a big number. How can you think about it? Well, you can think about it this way. I'm from the state of Colorado. We have about a little over 4 million people in our state. So we have to get rid of everybody who's in Colorado. It would be equivalent to doing that. And we'd have to get rid of everybody who is in Ohio to come up with numbers that would be equivalent to uh, sending home essentially 15 million people. Think about what that would do to our economy. 5.6% or so of the labor force in the United States, the workforce, is comprised of people who are in the country illegally. They're doing jobs that Americans won't take, at least not, um, you know, presently. People don't want to work on chicken processing lines. They don't want to go pick tomatoes in the hot sun. They're not going to go pick peaches on the uh, western slope of, of Colorado or milk cows or, or do a lot of the jobs uh, that uh, illegal immigrants are doing. And so you would have a decline, the estimates are, uh, you'd have a decline in the labor force of about 11 percent. It would cost in the uh, gross domestic product about uh, $1.6 trillion. And the cost of rounding up everybody and getting them home, I mean, we do have laws. You know, we are not, you know, Germany in the 1930s. You can't load people onto cattle cars and send them where you want to send them. Uh, we have due process, even for people Ill here illegally. And so you have to go through the system. And the estimates are it would take 20 years to process, and because we are capable of processing about 400,000 people a year, and it would cost between 400 and 600 billion dollars. So I'm here to tell you this is not going to happen, and those people who think it is going to happen, um, you know, are not thinking straight. And frankly, if they live in communities where illegal immigrants are working and living, they really don't want it to happen. Because if it does, it's going to depress property values. Stores are going to go out of business. They're not going to be selling to the people who are working. And by the way, if you're there, I see a few gray hairs in here, and my hair is gray under Miss Clairol. Um, um, you know, I'm on Social Security. Uh, I certainly don't want those people to leave because they're contributing a whole heck of a lot of money to the Social Security Trust Fund, like $12.6 billion a year in payments that illegal immigrants are paying into the system. They're paying more than $10 billion a year to the Medicare Hospital Trust Fund. Um, so they are supporting part of that social welfare net um, that some of us who were born here, be fortunate enough to be born here, uh, get. So uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And then the question is, what do you do about it? Well, I have two responses to that. 
everybody says, well, you know, you have to enforce the law. Well, conservatives say that, but they're not real fond about the idea of enforcing Obamacare. You know, nobody is saying, well, it says right here on page, you know, 743, subsection B, you know, part two, that you have to do such and such, and by golly, we got to do that because it's the law of the land. No, we say, as conservatives, it's a lousy law, and we ought to repeal it and change it. Well, I believe that the laws that are on the book now that go back to the mid-1980s uh, on immigration are bad laws. They are unenforceable. They are essentially big government and big brother wedded together and writ large. Probably you don't even know this, but those of you who are um, out doing jobs, I hope that whoever has hired you, even on a part-time basis for a few hours a week, uh, has asked you to prove that you are in fact entitled to work. I hope you had to produce your passport or your birth certificate in order to get that job. And if you're an employer, even if it's somebody who's cutting your lawn, you know, once a week, or maybe, you know, you're a working mom and you've got some help around the house, you better have filled out an I-9 form. And not only should you fill it out and make sure you've checked the documents, but you better file it away and keep it for three years. And if, you know, Mary doesn't work out and you have to get rid of her and hire Susie, uh, you better make sure you keep Mary's papers for three years and then you have to fill out new papers for Susie and you have to keep those for three years and on and on. And, by the way, the people who want to solve illegal immigration say, well, what we really need to do is to make it harder. We have to make sure that people call Washington, D.C. and get permission from the federal government to hire somebody. That's a really conservative idea. Uh, this is, you know, this is the solution. How are we going to keep people from hiring Ill illegal immigrants? Well, we have to turn every single employer in America, from the smallest to the largest, into supplicants to the federal government and get permission from the federal government before we can offer a job to someone. To me, that's not a conservative solution. So I have a different alternative. We have to do something about the 11.3 million people here. And in fact, there was a compromise. It wasn't a perfect bill. The Senate bill that was uh, uh, the so-called Gang of Eight bill that Marco Rubio and John McCain and others uh, sponsored, it certainly was not a perfect bill. Uh, the Democrats were able to throw in a whole bu bunch of junk that had no business being in there and would make things even worse. But the main provisions of the bill seemed to me a proper solution. As I said, illegal immigration is a civil offense. People who came here illegally, if we're going to bring them out of the shadows and, and normalize their status here, they've got to pay a fine. Now, when George Bush, uh, George W. Bush was in office, he proposed that that fine be about $2,500 a person. That's a substantial amount of money. And um, he also suggested everyone would have to go undergo a background check. And in fact, the, the Gang of Eight bill required that as well. Uh, and people would have to demonstrate that they had paid their back taxes, that they had in fact been contributing members uh, and had paid their taxes. And in fact, again, most people don't know this, but about two-thirds of people who work illegally in the United States already pay uh, their Social Security tax, their Medicare tax, that's how we have those excess contributions. Uh, many of them, uh, if they earn enough, also pay income taxes. And even though they don't have Social Security numbers, because they're not entitled to them unless they're, you know, have phony Social Security numbers, uh, they, the IRS, they could care less whether you're legal, illegal, born here, not born here, you know, if you landed from the moon, they just want your money. So they are happy if you show up to, you know, apply for an employee identification number, they are happy to give you that number and they are happy to take your cash and to take it out of your checks and to collect it. So most of the illegal immigrants who here are already paying tax, but some aren't. Some are working for unscrupulous employers, they're working under the table, and so those, those taxes should be collected. I happen to be an agnostic on the subject of whether or not those who come here illegally should be given citizenship or not. I personally favor citizenship because I think it ties people to the country. I want everybody to want to be an American. Uh, but I could live with a compromise that said, if you broke the law, you're going to be able to stay here, you're going to work here, you know, get right with the law. 
but you're not going to be able to become a citizen. Your children are going to be citizens, but you're not going to be a citizen. I could live with that. And by the way, most illegal immigrants could live with that. They've actually been polled. There have been numbers of polls on this. The Pew Research Center has done a lot of polling on this. And overwhelmingly, what they want is the right to live here in peace, to be contributing members of the society, and not to have to worry that they're going to be you know, disappear overnight and be picked up and, and sent home while their families are, are here. So I think there is a possibility of a compromise there. But the most important part of fixing this problem is taking a look at what to do about our legal immigration laws. Back in 1986, President Reagan was confronted with then four million illegal immigrants, and he decided to give true amnesty. He didn't ask for a fine. He didn't ask for criminal background checks. He just said, basically, you show you've been here this long, you get to stay. And he did that as part of a package that was coupled with the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which enacted what I consider these draconian measures that I think are very non-conservative, that, that make employers, including individuals, have to ask permission to hire somebody, that make them have to gather all this paperwork and keep track of it and, you know, Essentially, they can, you know, become uh, just as, you know, much criminals or, or uh, civil offenders as, as the illegal immigrants themselves if they don't keep those records. So I think that law needs to be scrapped, and I think what we need in its place is a new legal immigration program that basically is based on what I consider to be conservative principles. These principles are that, you know, we believe in markets. Markets work. Employees are actually much better at deciding how many people they need to, to bring in to fill certain kinds of jobs than the federal government is, than some bureaucrat in Washington is. In 1986, we set a number on how many immigrants we, we were going to be uh, admitting, you know, for the next, that's 1986, that was 30 years ago. Uh, the numbers, you know, haven't fluctuated much. We've had one or two changes, uh, and we have little minor changes around the edges. But it's still this idea of Washington-driven. We now spend more in terms of enforcing our borders than we do on all other criminal law enforcement combined. People who say we're not spending enough, we spend $16 billion on enforcing the southern border. We only spend $14 billion combined on the FBI, alcohol, you know, tobacco and firearms, the Secret Service, the uh, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the U.S. Marshal Service, all of those other law enforcement agencies combined do not equal the, the uh, budget of what is spent uh, on border enforcement. So it isn't that we're not spending enough money or that we're not building enough walls, the walls aren't big enough. We've got to figure out a way to use and put market principles to work so that we admit people of the kind of people that we need and we do it in an orderly fashion, and it's flexible. You know, when we've got eight or nine percent unemployment, we don't need to be bringing a whole lot of people in because there are a lot of Americans out of work or a lot of other immigrants who are already here out of work, so we don't need to have huge numbers then. But when the, the numbers go down or when there are needs in certain industries like agriculture, like meat processing, uh, at the low end, and like the high-tech jobs, um, at the top end, uh, we need to bring those people in, and it ought to be skills-based. It ought to be based on what our needs are, and it ought to be flexible so that, as I say, lower numbers in bad years, but more numbers in good years. Um, and we also need a system where we don't necessarily bring in everybody to become permanent residents here. We create a guest worker program. We had a pretty successful guest worker program in the 1950s. I didn't have time or I couldn't carry it on the plane, but I have a chart that shows what happened when the Bracero program was enacted uh, and put into full implementation in the 1950s. You had one million illegal immigrants coming in a year then. That's twice as many proportionally as, as we've ever had coming in in the recent term. And um, what happened is we created the Bracero program. We gave, it was primarily agricultural workers that were needed in border states like California and Texas. 
we gave people the, the right to be able to go into Mexico, hire people, bring them over, have them work in you know, seasonal jobs, and then they went home for part of the year. And what happened was from a million a year, it dropped in the very first full implementation year to 65,000. That's over a 90% drop. We could do that again. So the way to, in my view, fix the illegal immigration is to make it easier in terms of our needs to be able to bring people in legally on a temporary basis or on a permanent basis. Uh, and I think, you know, that would have a major impact, uh, a far more effective impact than trying to build walls uh, or hiring more agents or putting troops on the border, all the things that really we don't have much of a, hi of a history and, and I think, frankly, would be a, a problem. But in doing that, we have to make sure of one thing, and that is that when we bring people here, we do what we've done so well in the past, and that is we assimilate them. They learn English. Now, you know, it's really funny because people do think that, you know, their grandparents all learn English. Not necessarily, but the children that were born here or if the kids were young when they came, they went to public school and they learned English. And so usually within a generation or two, they assimilated. And when you look back, for example, at the Italians, there's a huge number of Italians who came in the early part of the 20th century. A lot of people don't know this, but a third of them went home. They didn't make it. It didn't turn out. It turned out they really didn't like it here. It was too hard, and they went back to, uh, to Sicily or, uh, or the uh, main part of Italy. Uh, but the ones who stayed over a period of time did, in fact, in fact, move into the middle class and into the mainstream. But it took Italians 70 years from their peak year of immigration to when they caught up with other Americans in education levels. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over time. Well, the good news is that in terms of Hispanic immigrants, they are actually doing it faster than has been done in the past. Hispanic immigrants are, in fact, they're learning, uh, they're learning English. Um, the more than, I think it's 97% of second generation uh, Hispanics, that is Hispanics whose parents were immigrants, speak English uh, fluently. That is their predominant language. The majority of them get their news in English. You know, the, the Univisions and the telenovelas uh, and some of the programs that you see in, in areas where there are large Hispanic population. It's the elderly people who are watching that. It's grandma who's watching the telenovela or maybe mom. It's not the kids who are in school. They're not, you know, they want to be watching, you know, the shows that their classmates watch. So they learn English. Uh, and this is despite the fact that liberals for several decades have tried to stop them from learning English. Uh, I was a big opponent of bilingual education for, for many, many years. Uh, and you know, got a lot of enmity uh, in the Hispanic community for that. Uh, not among the immigrants, because they understood their kids, they didn't want their kids cleaning toilets and, you know, picking grapes. They wanted their kids going off to be engineers, and they knew that in order to do so, they had to get an education and they had to have English. Uh, but the middle class Hispanic advocacy uh, organizations and groups did promote Spanish language instruction so that kids were, in fact, segregated and uh, sent to, you know, learn their lessons uh, in Spanish. But even despite all those efforts, it hadn't worked very well. Uh, they have ultimately do learn English. But they've also done some other things that are quite remarkable. When I started writing about this issue and started doing research into the Hispanic population, and my first book came out in 1991, there was a pretty substantial education gap between Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites. Hispanics really lagged uh, in education. They didn't go to college. A very small proportion went to college, about 20% or less. Uh, and there was about a 20% gap in terms of high school graduation rates, uh, even among U.S.-born Hispanics. And I was concerned about that. And one of the interesting things was part of the reason they didn't go into school is they had a very strong work ethic. And so kids would graduate high school in, and or maybe they'd be a junior or a senior in high school and they'd find out they could make $15 an hour working on a construction site and they lived in big families and mom or dad said, you know, go down and get a job. You know, we need the money. We're going to want to buy a house. We want to start a restaurant. We want to start a landscaping company. You go out there and 
and, you know, get a job. And so that was one of the things that was sort of deflecting. Well, that's not happening anymore. Uh, and in fact, the recent statistics on second generation Hispanics, the children of, of Hispanic immigrants, is that their high school graduation now lags 2% behind that of non-Hispanic whites. That's nothing statistically. That's, that's the margin of error practically. So it means that we basically close that gap. And for Hispanics who actually graduate high school, uh, two years ago this trend started, more of them actually went on to further post-secondary education than non-Hispanic whites. You know, go figure. I don't know what happened. Maybe the jobs at the construction site dried up, and so the you know parents said, well, you may as well go to the junior college. Now, they're not graduating from four-year colleges in the same uh, numbers as non-Hispanic whites. There, many of them are going to two-year colleges. But from my point of view, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because if they were going to four-year institutions, many of them would be going on the basis of affirmative action, and they'd be ending up in schools where their grades and their test scores really wouldn't allow them to compete. So uh, they end up going to schools where their preparation, you know, prepares them for it, and, you know, they then may finish that two-year degree, and maybe they'll go on to get a four-year degree. So they're closing that gap. They're closing the income back. Half of all uh, Hispanic immigrants own their own homes. Uh, you know, this is not a welfare-dependent uh, population that we have to w be worried about for generations to come. They're really, really doing very well. And the ultimate uh, test of assimilation, in my view, is intermarriage. When we talk about the melting pot, the real melting pot happens when people of different ethnic backgrounds intermarry. And for the Germans and the Irish and the Italians and the Jews, that didn't happen for generations. It really took a long time before you saw that kind of mixing. Uh, now um, it's happening rather quickly. Uh, again, with second generation Hispanic uh, children of immigrants, uh, about a quarter of them will marry non-Hispanic whites. And among the college educated, about half do. So that's going to be the ultimate melting ground. And in fact, some people have pointed to the fact that there seems to be a kind of drop off in the third generation. Some of the statistics don't look as good for the third generation as they do for the second. Well, this is a phenomenon that happens to be true of all immigrants, whether you're talking about Chinese or Indians or, uh, or Mexicans for that matter. And some of it is that the children of immigrants are very motivated. Their parents have struggled very hard to get here, and so they work very, very hard. But another factor that may account for it is that some of those third generation who have intermarried, they may be the product of an intermarriage, they simply drop off the screen because they no longer check the box. Uh, they no, no longer self-identify. They're just Americans. Uh, and so the most successful ones we may be losing in that statistical pool. Well, let me um, end with this thought. Immigration. Uh, it's a tough issue. It's always been a tough issue. It's always been a divisive issue. It's no different today than it was in the past. But it is also not so broken, and it is not something that is so difficult to fix, you know, that it is comparable to, you know, taking a, a flight to Mars uh, or a brain surgery. Uh, it's not rocket science. It is something that is fixable. But we have to have the political will to do it. And that means people being willing to stand up and say what they believe in, not just what they're against, but what they're for. And it has to be done in an atmosphere where we're not demonizing people who are coming here. Uh, you know, if you live in a small village in Guatemala uh, or Mexico or El Salvador uh, or, you know, a, a town in China, uh, or a village in India, and you want a better life for your children, uh, you're going to want to come to a place where you can build that life. And the fact is that in America, we have always been the country that welcomed those people. And the reason we are the greatest country in the world, in my view, is that we take the best and the brightest. You know, Donald Trump said, well, Mexico is not sending its top 1%. Well, that's true. No country sends its top 1%. The top 1% in every country, the elite, they're doing fine. They have no reason to want to leave. It's the people who are sort of in the middle or even in the lower part, but the people who are risk takers. 
Think about how hard it is to leave a place that's familiar to you, to go to a country where you don't speak the language, where you may not even know anybody, where you're not sure that you can get a job or that you're going to place, you know, be able to find a place to live. Think about taking that job on the poultry processing line, having to cut up chicken parts all day long for eight hours a day, standing on your feet, difficult, hard work. Uh, and think about what it takes to be that person. It's a special person. It's a person who has the kind of motivation to be able to make it. And by the way, one of the other things that Trump talked about was crime. You know, he said they're all criminals and rapists, et cetera. Well, there is a relationship between immigration and crime uh, in the United States. It's an inverse relationship. The higher the immigrant population in an area, particularly in a low-income area, the lower the crime. If you charted crime in over the last 40 years in illegal immigration, you would see illegal immigration going up until recently. You'd see crime going down at the same level. Is this just a coincidence? Well, it turns out there have actually been some studies that have gone into communities to try to find the answer to that. And what they find is the reason that crime goes down is that the people who come here are those special people. They're parents. They're a father trying to make a better life, either to send money back to the village wherever he came from or to provide money for the children who were born here. They're out there working. Uh, they're not out there preying on other people. And by the way, they're not on welfare. They're not eligible for welfare if they're illegal immigrants. Their children may be eligible for things like free lunch programs. And from my point of view, too many of them are put on those roles. But I think that's a result of government wanting clients. And they go out and actually recruit people. And a little, you know, uh, Juanita goes to class. And, you know, they find out that her family earns less than the, the poverty line. So they put her on the free lunch program. Well, who's going to turn that down? Nobody's going to turn down free stuff. It's just not in human nature. Uh, but the problem, if we have a problem there, is to attack the welfare system and the welfare rules. It's not to attack the people who are coming here to try to make a better life. So I want to leave you with just one thought, and that is a thought from Ronald Reagan's farewell address. You know, he talked a lot uh, in his presidency about the shining city on a hill. And I'm sure, while some people might not know the origins of that, you here at Hillsdale know that it goes back to John Winthrop in 1630, uh, and it goes even before that uh, to the Bible, to the Sermon on the Mount. But Reagan invoked that image all the time. And he chose in his parting speech, his farewell speech, the last speech he gave as President of the United States, to talk about what that image meant. And he said something that I think is very important and frames what I believe ought to be our immigration policy. He talked about that Chinese city on a hill, and he said, if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's the America that I believe in. I think that is making America great again is by enacting that kind of policy. Thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, take questions, so, and I'm sure there are some. I hope there are some. Yes, right here. I just want to say thank you for coming. It was a pleasure to hear your, uh, hear your opinion on these matters. However, I think that your discussion kind of glossed over two primary realities. First and foremost, Milton Friedman teaches us that we can't have a welfare state and open borders. And I think that you have to choose one or the other. And most importantly, I think that um, the America my great-grandparents immigrated into is a lot different than the America these immigrants are immigrating into today. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. I went through the public school system there, and I my classmate, I had some classmates that were legal immigrants. And what are they taught in history class? They're taught America is an evil country, that the founding fathers were racist, and that, they, and that in the Mexican-American War, they took their ancestors' lands, and they deserve, uh, they deserve justice today. And, I, and my great-grandparents on the other side were taught America is a great country, and they were instilled with a work ethic. So absolutely, I think it's becoming easier to become American, but harder to know what it means to actually be an American, and I think that... You, you have hit 
the nail right on the head. And I think this is one of the greatest causes of fear today. Um, but it's a problem. I mean, there, it, it is a problem that has a solution. The problem and the solution, the problem is not the immigrants. Uh, and the solution is not, you know, slowing down immigration or sending people back home. The problem is the welfare state. I don't like it that 47 million people are on food stamps in America today. People are not going hungry. Uh, it's a freebie. And, and again, it's the Obama administration has created a huge client state. Uh, I mean, you know, I can't remember the guy's name. There was a, um, a Scottish, maybe some, one of the professors here will know who I'm talking about. But I think he was a contemporary of, of uh, Adam Smith. But he talked about democracy and the traje trajectory of democracies. And he talked about what happens in, in democracies is, is at a certain point when everybody's voting, they start voting themselves benefits. And then who? Alexander That's it, Alexander Tytler. So they start voting themselves benefits. And then, pretty soon, you know, Mitt Romney wasn't wrong. We have a, you know, large chunk of the American population that lives off government in one form or another. And I count myself as one of those people as a Social Security recipient. I have paid in at the highest levels most of my working career, but my mother lived to be 90. If I live to be that old, I will still collect more in benefits than I ever paid in. It is a transfer of wealth from the working young to the elderly. So we have become this nation of takers. And we are no longer, you know, builders. So yeah, we have a problem. The, the problem, we have to hit that problem. But the problem is the welfare state. Let's attack the welfare state. On multiculturalism, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I have been a, you know, I've been booed off stages. I've been denied the right to give commencement speeches because of my views on this issue. And the last time I spoke at Hillsdale, it was about multiculturalism and th the threat to the American way that multiculturalism posed. Because the fact we are an exceptional country, we do have certain beliefs and values, and those must be transmitted to the young. But the problem isn't so much your classmates. I mean, they're a fraction of the population. What about all the kids, you know, Johnny Smith and, you know, and Susie Jones? They're getting fed this nonsense too. And so it's the entire problem of our education system and multiculturalism uh, that we need to attack. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't want to be, you know, uh, taught that, you know, uh, that my forefather, you know, uh, well, my family came here before Mexico, you know, even existed as an independent nation. They came to what is now the United States. So, you know, but if I don't want my children taught that the president of Mexico should be their hero and that they shouldn't look up to George Washington or Abraham Lincoln because, you know, he, they were a bunch of old, you know, dead white guys. Uh, it's a problem for the entire society. And multiculturalism is absolutely something uh, we need to stop and we need to stop pushing. But it's not immigrants that are pushing for that. It is native-born Mexican-Americans who created bilingual education programs so that they could be, you know, given an extra stipend for teaching those classes. It was not the immigrant parents. And in fact, John Miller and I uh, worked on a campaigns to try to end those programs in the state of Colorado, um, in California, and elsewhere. And it was the immigrant parents who were the bedrock of opposition to bilingual education because they didn't want their kids scrubbing toilets and picking tomatoes. So uh, yes, we have those problems. But those problems are not the immigrants' problems. They are our problems as a nation. And we have to attack those problems. If we had never had another immigrant come into the United States again for the foreseeable future, the welfare state would still be a problem. And so would multiculturalism. Yes, in the back. Um, so you talked just a little bit about this at the beginning of the speech. Why do you think the Republican Party today is so opposed to well, I think there's a lot of misinformation and lack of information out there. I think when I go out and I spend most of my time speaking to conservative groups trying to persuade them on this issue, and I've had some success actually, um, they're surprised when they hear the numbers. 
um, often, you know, the skeptics will say, where do you get your numbers, you know? And I'm, I say, well, I get them where everybody gets their numbers. You get them from uh, research organizations. You get them from the Census Bureau, um, you know, the people who gather statistics. Uh, but there has been resistance. But I think the biggest problem is economic anxiety. What I find when I speak particularly to uh, older Republican groups, they're worried about their grandkids. They're worried about whether or not they're going to have jobs. Now, I always ask the question, well, do you really want your child to work at the Pilgrim's Pride processing, you know, chicken? And to a person, they almost always say yes. But believe me, they don't want their child doing that or their grandchild doing that. Um, and, you know, the chances are we could pick up those jobs. We could transport them to Mexico. I happen to have sat on the board of Pilgrim Sprite for five years, and those jobs can be sent to Mexico. Uh, but, you know, that's not going to help the people who are in these communities. Then, you know, the people who rent houses are going to have, you know, no tenants, and the people who sell cars are going to be able to sell cars, and the stores are going to have fewer customers. So that's not a solution. Uh, but it is that economic anxiety. And the second thing is the question, you know, a, a part of the question that was raised uh, initially. People really dislike having to press one for English. They don't like that. This is our country. I mean, even Trump said, you know, Bush shouldn't be, you know, he should speak English. Well, again, this is a fact of life, and it has always been true of immigrant groups. They don't learn English immediately. It takes a while. Uh, they didn't learn it when they were speaking German or they were speaking Italian. They don't learn it as quickly as we'd like when they're speaking Spanish. The important thing is their children are learning it. We should make it absolutely uh, imperative that their children be taught in English so that they will learn English. And in terms of an immigration program, I would be for giving points in an immigration system that gave points for English fluency. There's a lot easier uh, to, you know, get a job if you speak English, and it'll be a better job than if you don't. And frankly, anybody who spent any time, you know, in the tourist parts of Mexico, there are plenty of English-speaking Mexicans. They can, you know, people learn languages. So uh, I think those are the two things that are driving it more than anything. Yes? And it probably is not just Hispanics, but some of the other groups that have come in. Also, this sort of <coughs> native pride, which is out there waving flags. Well, I, I think, you know, you're right, Mary. There, there is that problem. But again, it's mostly fueled by left-wing third generation PhDs at UCLA and USC and other places that are promoting this and, ba and passing out the Mexican flags and the Salvadoran flags. And the whole multicultural movement feeds into it, absolutely. When kids go to school in the old days, they used to want to become American. But, you know, when I lived in Purcellville, Virginia, which is a rural area, and I went to the July 4th celebration, there were lots of immigrant workers there, uh, in both in construction and in, in some of the farming and, uh, and agricultural work there. And, you know, what I saw around me were, you know, little Salvadoran and Guatemalan and probably Mexican kids waving American flags. So, you know, we still have some of that. And it is, there, it is a problem, but I think it is fed by the elites. I don't think it is so much the immigrants. Um, one of the things about Los Angeles, I talked about crime a minute ago and the inverse relationship. Los Angeles, which used to have terrible crime, is now one of the 10 safest big cities in America. And in fact, of the 10 safest big cities, and that's defined by 100,000 or more population, seven of them are cities with very large Hispanic populations, and all but one of them uh, are in fact border states. Uh, so they're, you know, the population um, is not as fearsome as a lot of people worry about and think about. I know we hear a lot about gangs. Gangs have, you know, again, been part of the immigrant experience going back to the, uh, the gangs of New York. I don't know if any of you saw that movie, that Martin Scorsese movie, but, you know, that was about gangs at the turn of the century. So, uh, yeah, there are some problems, but overall, 
uh, it's not been a negative experience. It's been a good one. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't make sure that our public policies promote assimilation. And that's why I would give points for people uh, to learn English. Yes. Thank you so much for your conversation today and lecture. We really enjoyed it. My question is going to go to something that um, you did mention a little bit, but I want to hear a little bit more about what, what you think about this. So there's been instances of crimes taking place, obviously spurring the legislation Senator Cruz sponsored right. case law, et cetera, there. Um, my question for you then is, since the U.S. Constitution affords U.S. citizens rights to due process and so forth, with as federal government protecting our rights as citizens, would you extend due process to those criminals of e that are illegal in the country, or in fact, would you favor ICE detention and then de deportation for the criminal? Well, it isn't really a matter of what I favor or not. It is a matter of law that they do have due process rights. Even illegal immigrants have due process uh, rights uh, under our laws. Anybody who is here, even if on a temporary basis, even if you're illegally, has a certain amount of due process that is due them. Do I think that people who commit crimes and who are illegally present should be that we should take care of them. I think they ought to go to a Mexican jail. Uh, Mexican jails are not very pleasant places. Um, and I would much rather, you know, I don't, I don't even care if we, you know, give stipends to the Mexican government to, to house them because it'll be a lot lower than what it costs to house them here. Uh, so absolutely, look, these crimes, there have been a couple of very high profile crimes in California. It's disgusting. Uh, it's horrible. Uh, these people shouldn't have been here. Uh, it, it is, uh, these are people who were caught, who were sent back. Um, but, you know, uh, it is still possible to get in. I don't know that we will ever solve that problem. Uh, we can't build a fence high enough that people can either come across it, get in a boat, go up to Canada and come down that way, or d dig a tunnel under it, uh, or frankly, bribe officials. There's a lot of bribery that goes on uh, with uh, the Border Patrol. Uh, people turn the other way. Um, you know, so uh, we're never going to totally solve it, but I am absolutely in favor of anybody who's committed a serious violent crime. We got to get rid of them. We've got to make sure they're gone. Yes. Right. Well, it you know, it's very interesting. First of all, let's remember that drugs come to the United States via Mexico because Americans buy drugs and use drugs. There is a market for them here. Uh, believe me, they wouldn't be coming here if they weren't making big profits doing it. Interestingly, most of the hard narcotics, besides marijuana, the you know the cocaine, the certainly the heroin, the uh, uh, you know, the really hard drugs used to come through the Caribbean. And they came in in flights, they came in in boats. The uh, Drug Enforcement Administration was very successful in cutting off that avenue. But what happened is that instead of the Colombians, you know, picking coca leaves, sending them, you know, through the Caribbean and into the United States, that avenue got stopped, so now they come up the land border and they come through Mexico. So um, what you're seeing now from Mexico is in part the result of the success in stopping the trade uh, through the Caribbean. And um, you know, it is one of the reasons that I think we should have a legal way for people to come. You know, we let in about 600,000 people uh, a year now under our, under our legal system, but at times when we have you know, high, un high employment and low unemployment and certain jobs that, that uh, we need immigrants to fill, uh, we, need, we may need a million. We may need a million and a half. If we had a way for people to come legally, they would not be paying the drug cartels to smuggle them in. So that would dry up a source of income to the drug cartels. And the drug cartels then could not use those people as mules to force them to bring in drugs in turn for getting them across the border. So I think it would actually have a positive impact, 
to have a legal way for people to come. And that $16 billion that's being spent, I've never known yet a government program that gets started and gets funded that shrinks. So my guess is we're going to see that $16 billion is going to continue to go up. It's not going to get smaller. But how about having that $16 billion focused on the really bad guys, the, the criminals and the drug traffickers and the human traffickers, uh, and all those resources uh, focused on them? So uh, I think by solving the legal immigration problem and allowing more people to come the legal way uh, would actually help us in fighting the drug war as well. Let's do one more question. Yes. Well, the evidence that I see shows that we are successful. When you ask young second and third generation Hispanics, they identify English as their primary language. That's where they get their news source. They identify themselves as American first. Um, in terms of even political uh, differences, I mean, one of the tragedies from my point of view as a partisan Republican in the Republicans' new harsh tone is that we're driving people who would be voting Republican away. You know, we've seen, I've been following this for over 30 years, actually going back to the early 1970s. When Richard M. Nixon was reelected in 1972, he got about a third of the Mexican American vote. The base for the Republican presidential candidate has been, the bottom has been about a third going back you know, 40 years. Um, the only time it's fallen below that is when there is a harsh anti-immigrant tone. And by the way, it isn't just Hispanic voters who didn't re vote Republican last time. Only 28% of Hispanic voters voted for Romney. Only 27% of Asian voters voted for Romney. And that is a, a population that has traditionally been more Republican. They tend to be small business people. They're well-educated. Uh, they are you know, the kind of people you would expect to be voting for lower taxes and smaller government. Uh, but because the party has been identified as anti-immigrant, it's turned off those voters. So I do think that you know, the assimilation still works. Uh, the problem with multiculturalism is a bigger problem than immigration. I worry as much about the, you know, we got 13% of the population as immigrants. I worry about the other 87% who are U.S. born who are being indoctrinated with. It isn't really even multiculturalism. What it really is is anti-Western anti-American. It isn't about promoting the great cultures of China or India or any of these things. It's about tearing down America and tearing down the United States. It's not about learning about other cultures. There's nothing wrong with, you know, studying other great civilizations. That's not what multiculturalism is. So solving the multicultural problem is a major problem just as solving the welfare dependency is a major problem. It's a bigger problem for the American born than it is, in my view, for the immigrant. Thank you very much. Linda, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. There, there was only one problem with her talk. Um, it was a part about Ohio. You're in Michigan, and you have, you have no idea how much we'd like to deport a bunch of people from, from Ohio. <laughs> George Will, George Will once wrote a newspaper column. He said, for every 10 immigrants we let in, we need to deport one college professor, <laughs> which I think is even, an even better idea. Um, I meant to give away a book before we started, and I completely forgot while I was up here. This is, this is Linda's book. It's called An Unlikely Conservative, The Transformation of an Ex-Liberal, or How I Became the Most Hated Hispanic in America. <laughs> I hope she's the most loved Hispanic in Hillsdale tonight. Um, I'll give it to the person who can, well, there, all right, there's, there's, uh, there's a question. Um, there's a blurb at the top of the book. It says, a brilliant, provocative, and moving book, a blend of the personal, often very personal, and the political. And this quote appeared in what critically important national magazine? National Review. <laughs> Lippincott gets the book. Um, I didn't write it, um, but, but, but somebody did. Anyway, Linda, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you for um, uh, Mr. Rosen next month. <laughs>